we've now talked about the holistic cross-validation procedure, and now it's time to kind of pull all of these pieces together and, and, and finally uh, talk about uh, comparing of uh, models. So when we're selecting model parameters, we have a very distinct possibility that we're trying a tremendous number of parameter sets. And, and so this uh, is, is definitely a concern from the charlatan's perspective. It's, it's also the case that, uh, that, that neighboring parameters, especially if you're doing a very fine uh, selection of parameter values, the parameter sets should, uh, if they're neighboring to, to other parameter sets, then you should yield very similar kinds of results. If this is not the case, then you really ought to be uh, suspicious of what's going on in, in your setup. Maybe you're not uh, slicing up the set of parameter values very finely, uh, or maybe you have uh, an incidental uh, win for one of the parameter sets. And especially that latter case, you need to be uh, cautious of. So this, this issue of many charlatans uh, co comes up very much in this, in this situation, and we're addressing it by, uh, by separating what we do with our validation set versus what we do with our uh, testing set. So validation set should be used only for uh, parameter selection, and the test data set, you should only ever look at that at the very end of the whole process. So, so in particular, when you're trying to justify the use of, of a particular model type uh, against uh, other uh, alternatives, Wh whether those are learned models or whether those are uh, other typical algorithms that you get used to solve these problems. All right, after hyperparameter selection and, and moving to comparison across models, uh, for each model type, we have end performance measures. So, uh, so, so for every test uh, data set and model instance of a model type, uh, we, we get one performance metric and, and we'll have a total of N of those. So, the, so this now gives us a distribution uh, of performance values that allow us to do a real statistical comparison against uh, this model type versus the, the other alternatives. And, and uh, because we are using these, this independent data, uh, the, the hope is that we won't be fooled by hyperparameter overfit. So, so because we're trying so many different hyperparameter values uh, at, the, at the previous step, we, we do have the potential for uh, picking one that just incidentally happens to work really well for this one particular case that we're testing for. And this last step where we're comparing across model types, that'll help us uh, with, with the independent data that will help us to uh, distinguish uh, real results from incidental results. Because each of the different model types are uh, seeing the same folds for testing, uh, we, we can actually do paired comparisons. So, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a moment here. All right, for, for model type one, we, we've um, now been through this process of our infold cross-validation. Uh, so across the, across the top are our different model instances. And there are N of those. And then across, across the vertical axis, these are our hyperparameters. And uh, each one of these on the validation set, as we talked about before, yields uh, validation performance. It gives us a whole set of values. And typically, we're looking at the, the mean validation performance across each of, those row, uh, each of those rows. Of these, then we pick the, the best. And this is with respect to our validation set. And at this point, we have one winner. for model type one, and, and we've selected a particular instance of, uh, of the hyperparameter. So for example, we might in the end decide that this is the best one that gives us one, one set, uh, it's one hyperparameter set, but we still have N models 
and we have n performance metrics for our validation data and we can either compute it along the way or we can compute it at this stage. We have n performance metrics for our uh, test data. Okay, so, so now uh, we have not just uh, one model type, but, uh, but uh, we have multiple. So this might be model type two, for which we've done the same uh, bake off between the different hyperparameters. And as we talked about uh, before, each model type will have different uh, types of hyperparameters. So it also has uh, advanced a winner. So we might, for example, uh, end up with uh, this particular hyperparameter choice uh, for the winning uh, for the, for the winning case. So that gives us again a set of n models and performance metrics for each of those blocks, one, one for each uh, rotation through the hyperparam sorry, through the validation set and also uh, for each rotation as, uh, as test sets. So if we have just the, the two of these models, then we can go about uh, comparing these two. And, and use our standard, standard statistical methods for, for doing this. So again, these are, uh, we have populations of our test statistics. I, I advocate, well, the, the, the general wisdom from the statisticians is that an N of 30 is a really good place to be. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but in practice, we tend to see N of uh, 20 for a lot of the, the literature. And that's still a reasonable place to be. But because the test set that we use to compute the metric for this uh, particular model uh, is the same as the test set metric here, this gives us an opportunity to do a, a paired test between uh, these two here. And, and likewise, paired tests uh, across each of the corresponding models. So we can do a, a paired, say a paired t-test. Um, what that's going to do is uh, look at essentially the differences in performance between uh, the, the top winner here and, and the, the winner of the, the bottom model type. We'll talk um, in a moment about the, the process of doing uh, the paired tests, uh, but first I wanted to uh, talk about the case where we have uh, M models. So with, with M models, uh, each one, again, has its, we've got performance metrics uh, for model one, for model two, model three will draw down here. If, if we have a, a lot of, well, there are a couple things that we can do here. Um, one is, uh, that's model five, and we'll go on around to model M. One possible uh, approach is, is to uh, do the uh, all possible uh, comparisons. So I can uh, compare model one against model two, and then I can compare against model three, uh, model four, et cetera. So this is one one possible uh, approach. Well, so that's that's the case for model one, but then model two also needs to be in, in this situation compared uh, against model three, model four, and model five, uh, etc. In the end, the number of comparisons, if we're, if we're doing all of these, if we need to do all of these comparisons, then this is really m times m minus one over two comparisons. That, that starts to get to a very, a very big number when we need to actually compensate for these, uh, th this number of comparisons. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about narrowing that down here uh, in, in a moment. Another possibility uh, is that uh, we, we use a statistical technique called ANOVA. And in, in fact, we're gonna do a one-way ANOVA. And, and here the, the idea is uh, to ask the question, 
of whether or not the model type matters. And with, with ANOVA, and, and I'm assuming everybody has a background uh, to, to know what ANOVA is, with, with a, ANOVA, uh, our null hypothesis is that uh, all are the same. And when I say all, I mean all models. And uh, one of the things that ANOVA will do is come back and ask what, uh, what, what is the likelihood that these are indeed from the same distribution. So what ANOVA will tell us is uh, what the probability is that uh, given the set of samples that we have from all M models, what the, uh, what, what the probability is of that particular set of samples coming from the assumption that all of the models perform the same. So if we choose to reject uh, the null hypothesis, then what we get out of this is that the, uh, the, the NOVA tells us uh, that uh, some that some model is, is uh, different. It doesn't tell us how many, it doesn't tell us really how much different, uh, and it doesn't tell us which one, uh, but by us having uh, a, a situation where we can reject that null hypothesis, that really gives us a, a bit more confidence in trying to do uh, take additional steps to actually figure out which model is indeed uh, different from the others or which set subset is different from the others. Let's come back to the question quickly about uh, comparing individual uh, models, so one model versus another. Uh, it's often the case that we use, uh, say, a student t-test uh, to, to do comparisons. Uh, if you really, if your hypothesis if you want your alternative hypothesis to be that uh, that one specific model is better than the other, then you want to use uh, one-tailed. Uh, but if you are just trying to figure out that they are different, then it really is a two-tailed test. Um, remember that uh, the student t-test does make an assumption that the underlying distribution of the performance metrics is a, uh, a normal distribution. The t-test the is robust to, to to deviations from, from that assumption. Uh, but if, if you have a very, uh, something very different than a normal distribution, then you should really proceed with caution. Uh, an approach that we take in, in my lab is, is to, to do sampling-based uh, statistics. And, and hopefully your, your statistics classes uh, talked about these. The, these are processes uh, where we just use the data as a means of uh, constructing an estimate of what the distribution looks like. Uh, these are very computationally in, involved uh, procedures, but with modern machines, it's, it's not uh, such a big deal. Um, but they are robust to, uh, to uh, any underlying uh, distribution. So, so they certainly do fine for, for small deviations from the normal, uh, but when you have a very large deviation from the normal, they will also do fine. These approaches also, as you, as you get closer to a normal distribution, they're, they're going to give you the same kinds of answers that a, a, a t-test will give you. Uh, in, in my lab, we use, uh, depending upon the hypothesis that we're actually testing, we might use a, uh, a bootstrap resampling approach uh, or a bootstrap randomization approach. And, and I can certainly uh, go into more details on those if, if that's of interest to the class. Um, what's also cool about these sampling-based approaches is that we can actually construct them in such a way that uh, they address uh, situations where the samples are not independent of one another. So, so there are specific uh, dependencies uh, across, uh, say, uh, different folds of your data set. Um, they're also quite good at dealing with uh, censored samples. The, 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 sen the sampling at this level of sampling where we're computing uh, 
uh, values over a, a metric over an entire fold of data. We're generally not censoring that uh, statistic. Uh, but if you're looking at, say, individual samples that are being taken from the real world, uh, there are lots of scenarios where uh, censored samples do come up. And we'd like to be able to explicitly take those into account uh, when, when we're computing uh, statistics. Moving on to the, the M model types, uh, if we have uh, more than two of these that we're trying to worry about, uh, then we uh, have the multiple charlatans problem or the potential for it. As we already talked about, uh, ANOVA uh, can tell us uh, uh, that at least one of the model types is different than the others. It does not, however, tell us which one is, is different. Um, but it's a nice, robust way uh, of uh, telling that there is some variation as a function of the model type. And in some sense, this sort of gives us permission to perform the, the pairwise tests. Uh, if ANOVA comes back and says there really is no difference uh, by model type, then uh, we should feel very uncomfortable about doing pairwise tests because we're computing statistics with uh, much smaller uh, sample sizes. Once we do decide that we can make comparisons across the M model types, we could certainly perform all possible combinations, uh, but this gives us uh, an order M squared number of comparisons, and this is often really overkill for what we need to do. A, a couple of alternatives. Uh, one, one is we might actually just care about uh, picking uh, the best of the M alternatives and then making a statistical argument that it is indeed the best. And, uh, and, and the way to do that would be to find the best and the next best and then do a statistical comparison between those two. This involves something on the order of M comparisons, depending upon exactly how you, how you do that. Uh, so th but this is much smaller than the, the, the order M squared of the, of the previous case. Another possible case is that we might have some sort of baseline model that we're comparing against or a baseline algorithm that we're comparing against, and that we want to show that at least uh, one of our uh, M model types is statistically better than that baseline. Uh, and, and so in order to do that, we really need to be doing M comparisons and M statistical tests. And again, just as with these other cases, we do have the multiple charlatans problem. Uh, in, in any of these cases, uh, the, the typical approach is to, uh, to use our Bonferroni or our SEDEC correction to adjust that p-value cutoff, that, that alpha value that we talked about in the last uh, video. One of the concerns, though, with this Bonferroni or SEDEC uh, approach is that these are very conservative uh, approaches to adjusting that p-value cutoff. Uh, they want to be really sure uh, before they will uh, reject the, the null hypothesis. And, and we can go back to our charlatan story and, and look at the alternative, which is to use new data. And, and so we can even take another step in building uh, a, a new holistic cross-validation approach that involves not three data sets, but four. So we have uh, still our train and our test, uh, sorry, our train and our validation data sets, but now we have two independent test sets. So, so the idea here is we use test set one uh, to, to uh, pick the favorite model of our M types that are available, uh, and perhaps the next best one, depending upon the kind of question we're trying to ask. Uh, and then once we've picked that favorite one, then we can use test set two to confirm that it is indeed the best. And, and at that point, this is a single statistical test that doesn't need any additional uh, correction. A couple of final uh, ideas uh, before we finish off. Uh, for hyperparameters, uh, if you are actually doing a set of tests that examine the question of how much training data you need for a given model type, then in some sense, the amount of training data is yet another hyperparameter. And, and so this becomes part of uh, the selection process that, that, uh, uh, that we'll go through. Of course, this also increases the number of hyperparameter sets that, that we would actually consider. When we're cutting up our data in, into folds, it is important to 
at least look at the question of whether or not these folds are statistically independent of one another. And, and one place where this might, that, that's, that, that's easy for this to come up is that of dealing with time series data. So, it's, so it's the tempting thing to do is just to take all of our, uh, all of our data, cut it up into regular intervals. Uh, and, and the challenge with time series data is that from one sample to the next in that line is that we do actually have, uh, we can have a, a reasonable, amount, reasonable amount of autocorrelation. So if I'm looking at uh, the value of a stock over time, the, uh, the price today is, is very correlated to, to the, the price that it was uh, yesterday. And, and if we have this type of autocorrelation, then you have a real danger of your, of your, of your uh, folds not being independent of one another. A, a simple way to fix this particular issue with time series is to uh, actually leave gaps in between the individual folds. It is also the case uh, because we are reusing our folds in the training process. So, so every one of our models that we're building uh, actually uses uh, overlapping data with the other ones. Um, we do have the possibility that this whole cross-validation procedure can, uh, can be fooled. Uh, and and the, the, the common way to think about it is that we just happen to cut the data up in just the right way that we end up with a, a very lucky set of results that talk about this particular case, but do not necessarily generalize uh, to, the, to uh, the rest of the universe of data. A, a, an approach to this uh, is not used very often, uh, but an approach is to uh, recut the data multiple times and go through the whole uh, cross-validation process uh, multiple times. If we, we expect to see consistent results, and if we do, then we feel very confident in what we're seeing. Uh, but there are, there are actually some formal methods for actually deciding how to, uh, how, how many times that we need to redo the process before we're we are really sure that we have a, a good result. All right, we are now uh, done talking about this process of, uh, of st doing statistically sound comparisons uh, of, of models and evaluating models in, in general. And uh, moving forward, we're, we're going to start using some of these skills in our homework assignments. Uh, and we're also ready to start working on some of the, the, the bigger uh, machine learning methods. We've, we've hit the sort of, we scratched the surface on, uh, on regression and on classification, and now it's time to, to dig deeper into each of those uh, types of uh, problems.